This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us today. I'm James Just. To your right is Richard Fields. And in the middle today is friend of the show, John Cameron. Gentlemen, the Congress and their PPP loans designed it in a way that their families and associates received a lot of benefit. This is a kind of corruption right in its face, and we're just no one kind of pays attention but us libertarians. What do you think on that? Yeah, I mean, Jim Baker, who has been, uh, I, I forget, either indicted or tried for, uh, for uh, fraud, uh, along with a couple of other companies that have been indicted or tried or found guilty or pled guilty uh, or pled, you know, uh, copped to uh, fraud and other uh, things, uh, have, you know, slipped through the cracks. Imagine that and uh, received these forgivable loans. In other words, it's a loan, but not really. It's a loan. But if you use it for payroll, you don't have to pay it back or among other things. So yeah. there's there's a whole lot of fraud going on. Uh, and the, uh, the other interesting thing is that we're now that was the first uh, relief act. Now Congress is uh, debating the second one, which would be for three trillion if the uh, Democrats get their way, or one trillion if the Republicans get their way. And I'm going to guess they're going to compromise uh, somewhere in the middle, like two point nine trillion, two point nine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, that's your compromise. Uh, yeah. Already, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has put together an eighteen-page wish list, not for people getting unemployment or uh, extensions or anything like that for all of the people who are members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Read airlines, read uh, cruise lines, read uh, medical uh, establishments, read uh, any number of uh, crony socialists, because they're not really capitalists, they're just people who pretend to be in business so that they can uh, milk the taxpayer. Um, the other thing the Republicans want is a, a, a negation of liability for businesses that open uh, while coronavirus is, is a thing. In other words, customers and employees would not be able to sue the businesses if uh, they get sick as a result of exposure to their employees who might have coronavirus. That's totally unacceptable. Well, I, I would think that, that it certainly is acceptable. I disagree. Imagine that. Um, that it's acceptable for customers. Uh, caveat emptor. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're going to go in a business and choose to do business with it, that's a, that's a choice. If you're going to lose your livelihood, on the other hand, if you have employees and they're required to be there and they're exposed by being employees, then you do need to be liable for it or else you need to cover their medical costs, one of the two. You can't be scot-free. But as far as a customer interaction, that's, that's a completely voluntary thing. Because uh, you can choose to do business with a, a safer store. Can you guys hear any background noise from me, or are you all right? Yeah, I think we got, you, I think we got your TV or radio yeah, in the background. Yeah, hold on just a sec. Can you guys lower that just a little bit? Sorry about that. It's the workforce, you know, half of them are on break right now. I like to give them these long breaks during the work day. Uh, you know, we only beat them for half of the day. Uh, you might be able to hear the drumbeat of the, the, you know, the person that keeps the oars in time as they, never mind. Anyway, uh, hopefully that's not interfering. So I think, you know, like any business, uh, if, if McDonald's runs a clean ship, you know, and I, I want to get a cheeseburger, whereas I go into XYZ or whatever it is, that wasn't a plug for McDonald's, by the way. Um, that's a choice I make. But if, you know, somebody says you need to be here, uh, to collect a paycheck and don't keep me safe. That's a whole different thing. So I think there's, I think there's, there's an argument to be made. I'd like to comment yeah, about point, point taken uh, customers, you know, you can make an argument that they're going into their, uh, on their own uh, risk uh, and employees perhaps not. Although employees have the option as well of, of whether or not they want to work at a, a potentially unsafe place. The whole, it's the whole idea of uh, granting un, uh, an exception from liability. It's the same thing that we see that Congress has done for, Pharmaceutical companies, for instance, pharmaceutical companies that make vaccines have no liability. They're exempted from liability if their vaccines uh, cause uh, uh, bad, bad effects or even kill somebody. Same way with nuclear power plants. Under the Price-Anderson Act, nuclear power plants are uh, exempt from uh, all except for the first uh, 
few billion dollars of uh, damage if, uh, if a nuke blows up. Uh, it's the idea that you can uh, hold, uh, that you can grant ex ex exceptions to uh, responsibility in, in essence for corporations. Well, I, and, I, and I get that when I said I object, it was kind of maybe, uh, you were right, yet there's a difference between the customer interaction and the employee interaction. And, you know, that you pointed out a, a great thing, that um, nuclear power plants didn't progress because they weren't safe enough to insure when they first came out. I mean, nobody, no private insurer would insure them um, because nobody showed them rock solid information or none of the power companies had the money to pay for a policy you know, a billion dollars a year. So the government stepped in and said, you know, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to pick up the liability other than that few billion dollars. Uh, well, what that meant was that only ancient uh, reactor technology was covered under this, uh, under this government mandate that we're going to pay. So, you know, if nuclear power would have waited 10 years or 15 years or however long it took to, to prove to the private insurance companies that, um, you know, we're, we're safe enough to exist and pay a reasonable premium for you to cover us in case of catastrophic accident or incident, they would have been much safer. And the, the uh, progress in that industry would have happened at such a pace that that you wouldn't be worrying about coal power plants or have all this inefficient solar and wind and all the rest of that. I'm convinced that wind power is actually changing some prevailing winds. Um, those windmills just sucking the energy right out of the air. But hey, uh, let me put my tinfoil hat on. Um, It'll so, fit, I guarantee yeah, you. Yeah, well, I can, it's made, uh, since it's actually aluminum foil, which is pretty darn cheap, you know, I can make one up depending on how fat my head is for that day. Um, so you're, you're right. This taking, um, uh, taking the liability out of it creates more risk. So I do agree with you there, but I, again, the point I wanted to make was simply that there's a difference between a voluntary interaction that a customer makes. They can choose between safer place A or less safe place B that has cheaper prices or taste your product. Whereas employees, you know, you're stuck. You want to put food on your table, especially with what? What? What's? What do you think the real rate of unemployment is now? Not the quoted, I don't know, 13, 14. Some, somewhere percent. between 20 and 40 percent. You take a guess. If you take yeah. a look at the uh, labor force participation rate, I think it's down to something like uh, I don't know, 60 percent, which would imply uh, a 40 percent unemployment rate. Uh, yeah. So you know, uh, how many of those people are retired, and how many of yeah. those people? What are was the highest? Do you remember job? offhand, Richard, what the highest labor force uh, rate was? Participation. It was close to uh, close to seventy percent, I think, back in the in the nineteen sixties. Uh, I don't. I forget exactly. Yeah. So the difference between seventy and whatever it is, fifty some odd. I think it's actually below sixty. Like. Yeah. I read, yeah, I read somewhere this weekend that it was estimated at thirty-one percent. I don't remember where the heck I read that because I read so much stuff this weekend. But I read there was the best estimated real unemployment rate is about thirty-one percent. That was the estimate. So it's it's a lot of people out unemployed, and some of those are unemployed because they kind of choose to. Like there's some of us who are, you technically can make more money on unemployment at least for another week, yeah. and so you know you're not out actually working because you don't need to. But that ends next week, so you know there's going to be a lot of people out looking again back for work in a, in another. Yeah, week. I have a feeling. I have a feeling it's not going to end next week. It, well, it might end next week, but it'll pick back up. You know, we we talked about this for before that. Uh, what is it? Uh, that that thousand thousand and fifty you're getting in California. California's unemployment is actually pretty low, considering the cost of living in the state. Uh, there are other states that pay a lot higher, and some pay lower. Uh, but people in California are getting, if they earn enough money, a thousand and fifty dollars, and and most of those people, that's one hundred and sixty-seven percent of their wages. Why in the heck would they want to go back to work? I mean, it makes no sense. But once that, if that money does indeed get taken away, and the most they can earn is about two grand a month, then um, you know people are going to have incentive to go back to work and push their 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 representatives to uh, uh, you know twist uh, 
Governor Nuisance's arm to, you know, lift some of these things that are keeping people from working. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah if you're a waitress and your store and your uh, restaurant has closed, what are you going to do? If half the restaurants, I read somewhere, half the restaurants aren't going to reopen. Mm -hmm. And so all those waitresses and cooks and dishwashers, they're going to be ready to go back to work, but where are they going to go work? Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, it's, it is an open question. Like some of us can go, we can pick, we can still pick up gig work for at least until California finishes cracking down on it. But then what are you going to do? So there's a bunch of diff there's a bunch of different uh, aspects working against kind of the average worker right now as we come back out of this whole mess because the yeah, not not to mention the fact that this is fiscal stimulus as opposed to monetary stimulus. Monetary stimulus is when the Fed lends money into the into the economy that tends to feed the stock market and the bond market as opposed to uh, in inflation in the stock and bond market as opposed to consumer price inflation. The money that's coming in through uh, fiscal stimulus, in other words, money going to people in the form of unemployment benefits or what or or other direct benefits to individuals, that tends to feed price inflation. And so the uh, 1050, I think you said, or however much people are making on unemployment right now, once price inflation takes off, it's going to uh, be cut way down. And so that's you know, inflation is going to be the, the next uh, uh, political issue. It probably won't happen for another few months, but it'll happen. Well, I think that there's there's a huge amount of cash that because these people have never made this kind of money before, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to have a spouse that still has a job or some savings or something, you're taking that money and putting it right in the bank or in your mattress or wherever you want. And people are buying a lot of toys right now. I mean, um, bicycle, sporting good, camping, you know, people are buying RVs. I mean, the, the people are buying a lot of toys. And I and I know I haven't looked at the debt levels, and maybe Richard or, or James, you have, but I don't know if, if people are taking on more debt uh, and lenders are crazy enough to lend it. I see an awful lot of new cars, even though the car sales numbers are really bad. Yeah, I think if you take a look at the numbers, I think if you take a look at the numbers, uh, consumers are cutting back. They're spending less money. On the other hand, uh, corporations are issuing new bonds like crazy because yeah. they can at essentially zero interest rates. Yeah. But you have people like, you know, companies like Apple uh, raising a huge amount of money with a new bond issue. They, they're flush with cash. The last thing they need is more cash, but they're doing it anyway, uh, you know, just to have some more cash in the bank in case they want to do go on an acquisition spree. Well, and I, but didn't I hear just the other day that retail sales were actually up like 7% or something over the same time last year, which is crazy. Oh, I, I doubt that. that. I doubt that. I heard what, of, what, yeah. what you're talking about, online, online sales versus in, uh, in yeah, store sales. Well, I doubt that they're up that much or yeah. at all, actually. I think there's about a 4 or 5% uh, decrease in business over the in the first yeah. quarter. Well, I, heard it on uh, NPR. Yeah, I heard it on NPR. So, uh no, I didn't hear it on NPR because they would never publish anything that reflected f favorably on uh, on the Donald. So. Well, as we're talking about prices, we're going to skip down to a story here. Um, California, there was a study recently that Californians are leaving the Bay Area and the state. And I just was watching a podcast yesterday where uh, Joe Rogan is apparently has decided he's out of here. He's leaving next month. Where's he going? I we haven't heard, but there's Texas is what is kind of is kind of a rumor, but I well, they haven't actually said exactly. Well, yeah, Texas. there's also a problem with with uh, real estate investment trusts that own office properties right now. They're worried, and they should be because should be. Uh, the uh, companies that have figured out that most of their employees or a good chunk of their employees work just as efficiently, just as productively, and just as uh, well from home as they do from an office. Why would they want them to come back to an office uh, anymore when they can reduce the cost of office expense by uh, drastically by having people set up their own home offices? That's that's going to be a thing that's not going that's going to survive the the uh, the shutdown. It'll that'll go on for you know quite some time, probably forever. Uh, and so people, in particularly in Silicon Valley, people who uh, are making their living by writing software or doing other things that they can do just as easily over the net as uh, in, a, in a cubicle, they're moving to what? Uh, let's move to the foothills. Let's move to Colorado. Let's move to Nevada. Let's move to Texas, where the cost of living is dramatically lower. And uh, I can make just as much money, uh, at least initially. Why, why, why fight the traffic? Why fight the crowds? Why fight the uh, contagion of being in a big city where a lot of people are infected with coronavirus when I can go out to the uh, out to the sticks and make just as much money and have a lot more acreage and, and have a 
uh, a much better lifestyle. Yeah, you're not oh, spending, yeah, thank you. Go ahead, yeah. James. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're not spending half your income or more on on a house that's you know a third of the size that you can get. Right, you're living in a shack in San Francisco for a million dollars, and with that, yeah, you're money, living in a 500 square foot apartment. Yeah, and you, you can go to Idaho or someplace, and you can live like a king. <laughs> so why would you want to stay in San Francisco? I don't, I don't understand it. Well, I, I, I agree with you guys and and disagree. I think a lot of people, you know, like getting out of the house and they like socializing with people face to face, and and uh, you know, they enjoy the camaraderie of the office, and and I, I know all the. The, you know, uh, Zoom people and all these other folks are saying that you can still create a great team, you know, with people at a distance and all of the rest of that. But the barriers to, you know, creative effort and teamwork, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot harder. And that socialization is is radically different when, you know, you you uh, when you can't be actually around people. And, you know, people in isolation are different. I think, and also, you know, working from home, it puts a huge stressor on uh, your family. You know, if you're, if you're lucky enough to have, uh, you know, a spare room in your house, which most people I know don't, can't even fit their car in their garage. So where are they gonna pick up a spare room? People, Americans acquire, especially acquire crap uh, enough crap to where how many billion dollar a year storage companies that are there. And it puts a lot of pressure on the family, especially when kids are homeschooled. So you're trying to balance, you know, work and all the rest of that. And I, and I, I know that some of this is going to happen. Um, and, and it will have, uh, I think long-term there is going to be a reduction in people who are going to office, but I think a lot of people will drift back to offices at least part time. So maybe the temporary office companies will make out or all the rest of that. But there, there's huge pressure on working families now having to, you know, balance homeschooling your kids because basically the school systems, uh, school districts have just opted out of educating and saying, you know, here's the curriculum, you know, watch this video, figure out how to teach your kids, you know, and you're juggling you know, people working from home and all the rest of that. I think a lot of people are going to run screaming back to the office as soon as they possibly can. Well, well I think it, there might have a difference between, that, of course, is the fact that you've got uh, the uh, outside the office, the social considerations that keep people in cities. In other words, for, uh, professional sports teams, the symphony, mm -hmm. the orchestra, the uh, art museums and so forth, mm -hmm. all of those things, which are good reasons to live in the city, uh, are closed. Mm -hmm. But they will reopen. Shut down they will reopen. Last, which seems to be interminable at this point. Yeah. Well, and I also think we have to go right after the election, then everything will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> we also have to remember that children, people my the people the age of my children and younger have a much different view of this whole internet relationships than say we do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 50 years old. I, we didn't we grew up with the internet, but it was still different. You still couldn't kind of have mass groupings. My kids have grown up interacting, playing, organizing on the internet since they could move a mouse. And so for them, being on Zoom is natural. It's just as natural as us would be to go to a meeting or to go to a coffee house or to go to someone's house for a party. They have parties online all the time. That's what they do. They've been doing it since they were kids. And so for the younger generations, for generation not millennials and younger, this whole you know remote working is their lifestyle. It's what they've done. And so for them, it's not as big of a deal. And so there is, going to be a massive change in how we work or how at least some of us work. Those who work in office settings or the office settings going to change. Warehouses are still warehouses. There's nothing in it. You can't work in a warehouse from home. So <laughs> there's, you know, there's another is reason not to work in a warehouse. Yeah. And then, you know, manufacturing the same, but thank goodness, you know, we've managed to crush manufacturing in this country to where that's not a concern. What is there? Three manufacturing jobs left in California. Um, and but we've, so, I think yeah, we, we've exported most, uh, you know, a good chunk of our manufacturing to uh, third world countries and you know, just as yeah. well. Uh, if we yeah. do provide the intellectual effort and they provide the muscle, so what? Yeah. Well, a lot of that manufacturing is dangerous manufacturing. And so we've kind of, in a sense, we've gotten the dangerous manufacturing away from our citizens. And so you say, well, that's good for us, but is it, you know, good for them well they get to build their economy up so they can stop doing dangerous manufacturing later on right that's how you get there well it's like china is a much bigger version of japan 50 years ago richard and i remember when made in japan meant crappy and now made in japan means 
higher quality than you can probably get here. Made in China on a lot of stuff, you know, and on lower cost stuff still means made made crappy. But you know, on tech stuff, they compete. So you know, they they're oh yeah, no, they're getting they're getting better and better all the time. And in fact, yeah. are uh, in many uh, areas surpassing the quality that we see in the United States. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, throw in public schools here or government schools. I, I, I want to punch myself in the face every time I say public school because it's government school. But, uh, yeah, it's government school paid for by the public. Yeah, that's if you dumb down your workforce far enough, they can't do work. Uh, you know, you, you've got to do that balancing act between keeping them stupid enough to keep you in office, but actually smart enough to uh, shine your shoes or serve you lunch at the restaurant. Yeah. All right. Well, talking about keeping people stupid. Uh, Customs Border Patrol have uh, started policing Portland. Apparently, since the Portland police aren't going to police it, Trump and the Border Patrol have decided that they're going to do it. it it's a, it's a, flimsy, a flimsy excuse that Trump has used to play to his base. The flimsy excuse is that he's protecting, I don't know, statues or, or, or federal government. Monuments, government office well, buildings. In, in, the, uh, in, the case, in the case of Portland, it was actually the courthouse. They were trying to burn down the courthouse, and so they yeah. came down. And, and so in Portland, you could actually make that one particular place around that Portland courthouse, you may be able to make an excuse for it. But yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's an excuse. Is, That's all it is. Yes. But now Portland, I did read something. Portland has had 100 arsons in the last 30 days. And so Portland is in chaos. And the leaders there don't want to do anything about it. Now, I suppose that's the... And know. so that's the reason that we have unmarked vehicles uh, driving yeah. the streets of Portland with, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Department of DHS or ICE uh, people in uniforms that just say... What, these are uh, the police of what... Uh, not reading them the Miranda rights, putting them in unmarked cars and hauling them off. This is uh, this is uh, this is worthy of uh, Nazi Germany and the SS. Yeah, well, sadly, well, it's kind of the way fine. things work these days. There's no knock raids are the same way. You bang in someone's door, you bust in, and you shoot them because they've shot back at you first. You know, we've seen this time and time again. This is just how our government operates. It's not. Sadly, I'm not surprised because we operate this way on a daily basis. We arrest people for not wearing masks. We arrest people for, you know, for being alone in the ocean. <laughs> and so now we're going to be surprised that some government agents walked around and are picking off Antifa leaders kind of off the streets. No, I'm not surprised at all. And because these Antifa people will not stand up for my rights. I will sit here and I'll say, yeah, it's wrong, but I'm not going to stand. There's a certain groups of people who I will not stand next to because they will stab me in the back the first opportunity to get. And so while I can sit here and say, yes, it's wrong to do it, I'm not going to expend much energy on it either because it's because our next story is, is it actually a perfect example of why I won't. And so we'll go ahead and skip to it because they're not actually um, exclusive. The couple was under house arrest, I believe, in Kentucky because the, the wife tested positive for coronavirus because she want, she went to the hospital to get tested for coronavirus because they were planning a trip to go see their grandparents and she wanted to be careful. And they wouldn't let her leave the hospital without signing a waiver that she'd self-quarantine and she didn't want to sign it without her lawyer present, so she left. And then the next day, the police show up and put ankle bracelets on all the family, including the children. So they're in her house. And is she test positive or negative? She tested positive. Everybody else tested negative, but they weren't going anyway. They were gonna. Their plan was to self isolate. They just didn't want to sign the piece of paper. No oh boy. Okay. Yeah. And so, and I said, so my question is, where is Antifa? Where is the left? They want to complain about fascism when it shows up on their doorstep, but they're unlike libertarians, where we argue over all these things. We complain about all these things. Where's the left? Where's Antifa? Where's the left when it comes to other people's civil rights being violated? Well, I don't know. We may have talked about it before, but there was a, an issue in Vanity Fair or a letter, I think it was, written by uh, somebody and published in Vanity Fair that was complaining about the lack of uh, respect for free speech on the part of the uh, left and tried to cancel it. So, the you know, the, the, the left is all in favor of free speech whenever it's their speech and wants to cancel it whenever it's anybody else's speech. And that uh, has always been the case going all the way back to uh, Marxism, Leninism, you know, in 1917, and it will always be the case. They are totalitarian in nature, their way or the highway. If you don't, if you don't uh, toe the party line, uh, then you need to be uh, shut up in any way possible. Absolutely. And that's, and that's, that's, also, that's also true. That's also true of fascists on the right. So it's not, it's, mm -hmm. it's true 
of totalitarian types. It's true of people who want to control the lives of others uh, in the way that they think is, is proper. So whether it's, uh, whether it's Nazis or uh, fascists or communists, it doesn't make any difference. They're all trying to run the world the way they think it should be run. And anybody that this is, uh, should be either shut up or gotten rid of entirely. You mentioned, you mentioned Richard, something uh, that I want to touch base on, and you said the socialist in Nazi Germany, and and people forget that that Nazi Germany uh, was socialist. I know national socialism, and yeah. national socialism was actually mentioned as a good thing. What is so? What is this concept of national socialism? And I saw it uh, on the web for about a week, and then I think the the people on the left realized that oh wait a second. If anybody does a Google search, first thing is going to come up under National Socialism is Nazi Germany, and so even though that's what they want to do, they don't want to, you know, send Jews to concentration camps. They want to send anybody who doesn't agree with them, uh, no matter, you know, what. Uh, but but it's it's got a bad rap. So you know, uh, National Socialism came out of socialism, and it's basically you know, like you said, my way or the highway. Whereas, uh, you know, then the ACLU used to be a bastion of free speech, no matter which side, and I hate to say side, left or right, because there are way more dimensions than left and right. And now it's uh, only supporting uh, accepted, quote unquote, progressive speech, which is actually regressive speech, because it is socialist and fascist. And that's, that's ancient history. That's, that's uh, processes and policies that have failed and been proven to fail every place they've been, been, been put into. But somehow that's what's going to rescue America from policies that, that created the most prosperous country uh, the world has ever seen. I don't get the thinking. Whereas going backwards and labeling it something new, labeling going backwards, how can they call it progressive when it's regressive? I don't understand. Somebody answer me. One of you two. Well, I can. What I can answer is we're just about out of time. But it seems to me that the left, the far left, and the far right are getting awfully close to each other. Mm -hmm. That's you go around. <laughs> yeah, they're getting Dang. awfully close. The far left and the far right are getting awfully close to each other, and those of us kind of who have been stuck between them are kind of getting left out in the lurch. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of it. Our time for the day. Thank everybody for joining, um, Richard, John. Thank you for for being here today on short notice. I know I get you guys on short notice this week, so I do appreciate you guys. Sure. Sure. Thank you, James. Thank you, John. See you later. We and knew Monday was coming. I enjoyed myself. You know, I enjoyed today. R Richard, can you sit? Let me. I, there's something on your shirt. I want to see. Can you tell me what's on your shirt? Today? <laughs> is that possible? No. What is that? Can you tell us about that, Richard? Yeah, it's uh, Joe Jorgensen for president. Oh, that's a that's a brilliant, brilliant. Uh, she's a therapist, right? Brilliant woman, and her she's, uh, uh, vice no, president. She's an uh, industrial psychologist. Or psych oh, okay. psychologist. Oh, also industrial psychology is basically training. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it says we're still live on on. Yeah, it's still live. Hey, it's good. The live one stays up on the page, so people come watch the live one. Yeah. It's the live and the YouTube audience yeah. are vastly and, different. And her parts. her vice president uh, Spike Cohen's pretty sharp guy too. He yeah, Spike is developer. Yeah. yeah. Spike Spike's a good messenger, so that's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd love to. I'd love. I'd love for him to hit whatever uh, moving goalposts they're going to have to hit to get part of the debates, which aren't going to happen, because then Biden will have to talk and it'll all be over. He just so, won't put them in the polls. That's what they'll do. And they cook in the polls anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, They'll just poll the big cities like they always do and not poll anywhere else. So what do you think the real polling numbers are for Bush versus not Bush? Oh, if only. Uh, <laughs> first Bush, anyway. Uh, never mind. Warmonger. Um, well, nationally, they're probably, it's probably nationally, it's probably, uh, Biden's probably a little ahead, but it term, doesn't matter nationally because he runs, he runs up the, uh, Biden runs up the score in California and New York, but it does not matter. So, yeah. you know, run up the score in California and New York, he's going to do the same Hillary thing. He'll lose, he'll lose the popular vote, but win the electoral college, if I had to make a guess. What do you think? It's hard to say. It's hard to say because uh, the one thing that Trump had going for him prior to January was the economy. That's uh, imploded, and he's done a piss poor job of managing 
Mm. That was the thing by anybody's definition. Mm. And uh, so I would say it's uh, leaning Biden at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Even even in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and the other the other electoral college uh, back, uh, battle states, yeah. I just think well, the so anti-American thing from the Democrats is going to not play well with the people who are be quiet will quietly show up. Well, here's the thing: now that now that he's won the nomination, Biden is going to appear. He's going to try to sound like a, a centrist, and that that you know that will appear. The only thing that Trump has got going for him is that. His enthusiasts are a lot are, are a lot more enthusiastic than uh, Biden's enthusiasts, which don't exist. Mm. Yeah, I just I think oh, no, I think, quiet, I think yeah like Biden people showing yeah. together going to show up kind of the silent majority type thing going to show up and just to stick their nose in the face of the of the media. I they're it's the only reason they're going to do it. Mm. And I I think that there are a lot of people who are enthusiastic. Anyone um, who uh, suffers from sleep disorder is a got to be a big fan of Biden. <laughs> and anybody who, who anybody who likes uh, kind of random prose, got to be a fan of Biden. You know, if you've heard him speak more than five minutes. Or either one of them as far as random prose is concerned. Oh, what well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think uh, um, what I, I read. There's only one candidate in, in this race who knows how to put uh, two lucid sentences together, and it's not Biden and it's not Trump. It's Jorgensen. Yeah. All right. That's well, on that note, uh, I'm going to go have lunch because that reminded me of uh, of something very important in my life. That uh, you know, being a good libertarian, we uh, uh, we we freedom of the market. And right now, I'm going to take that freedom to my my dining room table. So it's been right. a pleasure, fellas. Uh, right, as thanks, always, guys. this is Gail Morgan. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast on YouTube and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.